Hello, everyone, and welcome to Netlify's my second live stream anyways. And we have Kent C. Dodds here with us today. Hi. I am. <laughs> how are you doing today, Kent? Oh, good, good. I'm happy to be here. Wonderful. I'm very excited to have you here as well. I am Brittany Postma, by the way. I'm a developer experience engineer here at Netlify. And Kent C. Dodds is the Director of Developer Relations at Remix. And we are going to be talking about some Remix form data today and deploying that to Netlify with the K-pop stack. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. This live coding thing, we're going to be live coding today and I'm going to be driving a little bit. So you might have to bear with us in, in some cases, but mm -hmm. I think we've got everything in a good place and situated. So before we get started, um, do you want to talk a little bit about what stacks are? Sure. Yeah. So um, when we first released Remix um, uh, as like a, well, yeah, the re Remix was uh, originally released in... Um, 2020, the end of uh, 2020, and and I rewrote my website uh, to Remix in 2021, and just loved it so much that I decided to join the company. And one of the uh, challenges that I had when doing my website was all of the other things that are required to build a website, um, and certain uh, or at least one with the the capabilities and features that my website has. Um, if you're just doing a, a static blog. Uh, generate some files and stick it on a CDN. Uh, Netlify has you covered there. I, that's the way that I have been deploying apps for years um, that are all just static files. Um, but when you want to do something um, that involves uh, SSR and uh, databases and like all sorts of other things, then that's it's a lot of work. And even on top of that, if, if you want to build an ambitious web app, you probably want to have testing and probably TypeScript and a bunch of other things that are, um, if you know how to do it, uh, it, it still is annoying to have to work through all of that. Um, but certainly for a lot of people, if they wanted to build a, a full stack web app that um, had a database and authentication and caching with like a Redis thing or whatever, it's just a lot of work. Um, and a lot of things that are outside of the, um, uh, the wheelhouse of the typical Remix user. Like most, there, we have a lot of Remix users who are backend uh, focused and so they're really used to that stuff or people who have been doing this for 20 years and so they used to do all that. Um, but there are plenty of Remix users who are just front end devs who want to build a website and now they are being asked to like know how to do all this infra stuff. So um, it, it was kind of like saying, he, like, here's a basketball, watch Michael Jordan do a, a slam dunk. Okay, now you do it. And like, you know, <laughs> I was just like <laughs> expecting a lot of people. So we decided uh, to create what is effectively project uh, generators um, and just a, a really nice convention and API around that so that uh, um, people could just get up and running and, and have all that configuration done. Because most of the time, like the configuration stuff is something that you do once and you never touch again and it's no big deal. And so like generating that for me is not a big deal. Um, I, I don't typically like ge uh, project generators that are like code that I use a lot was generated for me. Like I, I, I'm not a big fan of that. I normally, I'll write my own, but, um, but for code that like I just need once and now the Docker file just works or whatever, then yeah, generate that thing for me and I will just not touch it. So uh, that's what, what Stacks is. We built three stacks that are um, the official uh, stacks that uh, deploy to two of them deploy to fly one with SQLite and the other with uh, Postgres. Uh, one of them deploys to uh, AWS uh, using Arc uh, Architect and uh, and uses DynamoDB. And then um, in the process, we realized, hey, we could actually make this be more than just like a, a remix thing. We can make it so that people can make their own. And and uh, frankly, I expect most uh, companies at least to build their own. Um, variants on these. So they can fork ours or they can just build it their own from scratch. Um, and that allows people to do some really sweet things. So there are like tons of stacks, dozens and dozens of stacks now uh, that people have made for themselves. I have my own that has like some of my personal preferences encoded that I don't want included in like the default one because I don't think everybody agrees with my personal preferences. But um, and that's name the yours? Mine's called the quick stack. Um, okay. It's supposed to be like a, a music subgenre uh, is the name, but 
Uh, I called mine the quick stack just because uh, I wanted to make like make something that was really quick for me to like spin up a quick demo or something. That was the yeah, idea. <laughs> that makes sense. So and yeah, yeah. So they're kind of like pre-configured bundles of popular tooling that you can get up and running quickly with. Yes. Right? Yeah. Exactly. And and for things that cannot be uh, reasonably like generated for you, there are instructions in the README on how to like pick up from where the tool left off. And so in the Indie stack, for example, it shows you how to create a Fly account and, and connect your GitHub workflow with the Fly thing because they don't have anything to, to do that for you. Uh, and then Netlify uh, came, like I think even before we'd officially released uh, stacks, we were uh, having conversations and the K-pop stack uh, popped up uh, pretty soon after the release. And so uh, that is what we're going to be working with today. Yeah, absolutely. Our our templates team was on the ball with that, so to speak. Yeah, and yeah, they absolutely. got the K-pop stack out. And so the K-pop stack is integrated with Supabase for the database layer. And then we also have Tailwind CSS. And then there's there's some other things in there like Cypress and let's see, TypeScript, ESLint, Prettier, and testing library for testing. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a couple of differences from like some of the remix stacks, but most of it is going to be the same except for maybe the Supabase layer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that's actually kind of the desire there is so people can try out a couple different um, hosts and just be kind of familiar. So uh, most of the stacks are uh, simple note taking apps. And so they have authentication built in, they have the data models set up for persistence of the notes and everything like that. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So I will go ahead and share my screen here and I'm going to go tell everyone like the flow that I kind of went through to get set up because there is some setup involved in these things that need databases. So there's configurations, there's environment variables and things that we had to go ahead and do. So I'll, I'll show the code here. And this is the K-pop stack website. I just linked to the GitHub repo on the YouTube account. And I clicked this deploy to Netlify button here. And once you click on that, it will take you through the process of connecting to GitHub that will, you can change to a different Git provider, use GitLab if you want. Um, I did a GitHub repo, it created the repo for me, and then it started that build and deploy process on Netlify automatically. So basically at that point, I was able to clone and get this going locally, and there is some setup. So I will go ahead and show off the readme here. As Kent was saying, um, there's some things in the readme to set up the stack. So I went through all of this and I set up my environment variable keys here in Netlify. I got all of that set up and running. And then I also needed to seed the database for what we were working on today. So I went to Supabase and I created all of the models and the tables that we needed for our form that we're going to be generating and creating. And I actually used Prisma for that. So it's kind of an interesting setup because the K-pop stack uses Supabase and the files that they have for let me see if I can find it here. It's called user, user.server is using Supabase instead of Prisma. But all of our stuff that we're going to be looking at and working with today is using the Prisma client. So we're actually using it in two different ways. I guess there's an open issue out there with authentication and using Prisma for authentication with Supabase. So mm -hmm. I didn't wanna try to switch all of these over to Prisma, but I was able to use Prisma for the new queries and it all works okay. And everything is is working, but that's, um, that's pretty rad because Prisma is pretty amazing. Um, so I'm glad that we're able to use Prisma here. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. I love Prisma, and I love that I didn't have to change any of these. So we were using. I think we created a fake book site on another stream that we did together, and in that one, I think we were using SQLite. Mm -hmm. If I remember, yeah, correctly. that was the indie stack. And so this was the exact same queries for SQLite that I just put into Prisma and. I set up the Postgres ID for the URL and it just worked. Like I didn't have to change any queries. I didn't have to do anything. It was incredible. So uh, it was, it was really awesome. Um, so a lot of this I've just copied over from the fake book site. These are all of our models that we needed for each of the form things that we're going to create. And I did create so a, a route. I've just copied over from the fake book site. These are all. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, um, and then I copied over the customer's route, getting over to the YouTube so you can comment too. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I, I, I love how it autoplays. And then you're like, Yeah, I'm oh, like, stop, stop, stop. 
<laughs> no worries. So um, is there anything here that we might want to walk people through before we dive into like creating the form and the different routes that we need? Yeah. Um, so I, I think... I think that it's okay to assume that people who are watching this have some sort of exposure to Remix, um, because otherwise, every single time I talk about Remix, I'll just be doing an intro every time. <laughs> every time. Yeah. But um, but I think one thing that's important to note in this file specifically um, is we're on the the customers uh, route, so we're in apps route customers .tsx. Yes. That's going to create a uh, route in your app at like myapp.com slash customers, and then. Um, this route yeah and we can take a look at that too i was gonna see if i could that's not what i want this is the local host and slash customers it's gonna take yeah. us to the or i can i did create a little nav bar nice. so that yeah, that's we helpful. can easily yeah <laughs> cool yeah so uh and what's interesting is if you look at the customers function here you see nothing in there about uh including a nav bar and that's because of nested routing uh, so that nav bar, I'm guessing you probably just have that in your root.tsx file, right? I do have that in the root.tsx file just so that it wraps the entire application. So yeah. I'm including it here and I've actually created a components folder that I'm... Yeah, sweet. Yeah, that's perfect. And and in that root, you'll see that right below the nav bar is outlet. And that outlet is uh, part of the nested routing uh, that says, um, if I have any children, this is where they go. And so that's why we have the... Um, the customer's route um, component right underneath the nav there. So that's one um, aspect that people may not be familiar with. Um, and then if you go to the customer's route module, uh, we also have that loader function. And that is a special function that runs only on the server. Um, and Remix will make sure that that function is always called um, for the server render as well as for client transitions. Like if you're on the home page and you navigate over to the customer's, uh, Remix will call this function for you, um, making like a fetch request to do that, um, to, to get the customers. And then it renders the customer component once those customers have been loaded. Yeah, we can actually see in the Netlify dashboard that it's using serverless functions for these. So if we go to our functions on the live site, you can see if I go instead of real time to like the last, I uh, haven't done any queries in a while, last day. So we can see that they're running these serverless functions every time a server call is being made. Yeah, that's sweet. And that's that's actually like making a call out to Supabase and stuff. And, and I saw some of those were like 20 milliseconds and stuff like yeah. that. It actually is pretty pretty nice. Um, yeah, 50 milliseconds, there's a long one at 100. Oh, there's a long one at 400, another yeah. 500. But uh, for the most part, <laughs> like. It's pretty dang fast, uh, even calling. So it's calling the serverless function, then it's calling super base, and then it's returning. Like, there's a lot of stuff going on there, and it's uh, pretty pretty fast. I, I might diagnose why that one was a half second. <laughs> but for the most part, like some of them are three milliseconds, um, which I think is, is pretty cool. Yeah, for the most part, they're really speedy. And that is something I would love to get into if we have more time later, is like these are running on serverless functions, which is different than edge functions. So I would love to talk like a little bit more about streaming and edge functions later on too, if we get time. Yeah, yeah, that was, that'd be sweet. Um, cool, so anyway, the, the it's important to know that the loader runs on the server only, and that's the only code that you write for loading data. So there's nothing that you write for loading data on the client. You don't worry about any of that. All of the uh, data loading from client to server is handled by Remix for you. Um, the other cool thing about this is that use loader data function on line 11 is a remix function and you give it that generic of type of loader and now you get uh, auto complete and, and type safety on that customer's object, which is pretty, that, that's this is this is really powerful. like database to the, to the front end type safety. That's yeah. Crazy. And it's just one little line. It's not like making your code extra verbose. It's not making it hard to read. And when you said that like the client and the server and Remix is just taking it care of it for you, I love that you call it center stack. I just <laughs> want to point that out a little bit because it like sits in the middle between the client and the server. Yes, yes, that's exactly what it does. And it does a stellar job. And it, it does um, branch out into either one of those uh, a little bit as well. Uh, there are a lot of utilities on the server side. Uh, as well as on the client side, stuff for like scroll management and things like that on the client and then stuff for um, 
uh, it polyfills the web fetch API uh, for the server, uh, as well as giving you a really nice uh, utility for cookies and management of sessions and things like that. So yeah, is there anything we needed to look at in those files for the server and client files down here? Yeah, I don't, I don't. Um, I mean, yeah, let's open up the entry server and entry client just to so people get an idea of this. So this is the um, the code. <clears throat> excuse me, the code that gets called when a, a user comes to your application for the first time. They're loading. We're doing a um, server render. And that handle request is um, called after Remix has called all of your loaders to get the data for that server render. So it takes the URL. It knows all the routes that need to be called, calls all the loaders concurrently. And then when they're all done, it calls the handle request. And, and you're responsible for taking that remix context, which has all of the loader data and everything in it, and rendering out the UI for that. And so uh, you're the one rendering remix server. You could even you could do whatever you want to. You actually could not even bother rendering the remix server component. You could render anything else you want, um, because all all your uh, in the typical use case, you're just going to return a new response that has the markup, the HTML markup. But we actually have somebody uh, who gave a a um, uh, uh, what is what did we call them? A B roll? No, not B B side. A B side talk for Remix Conf, um, which uh, um, his name is Andre, um, and he did a great job. But what he did was he made a Google Assistant skill um, using Remix. And so in here, instead of returning an HTML response, he returned some XML fancy response um, so that uh, he could use all of Remix's like routing and all of the magic stuff. It was really cool. That is really neat. Yeah. So so because we invert control for you and say, hey, you're in charge of this, um, you can do stuff like that. Uh, the other thing is when React 18 came out, um, we already supported render to pipeable stream because... Uh, you're the one who's doing that. So instead of calling render to string, you say render to pipeable stream and, and return the response, um, which I, I think is pretty pretty cool. I also uh, do some fancy stuff on my website for uh, sitemaps in here as well and, and things like that too, uh, which is pretty neat. So it's extendable. Like you, can, you yeah. can change it and use it however you want. And and the cool thing is it's not even API it, because it's just convention. Uh, and like most people's, like the, the typical use case, it's going to look like this. But if you're ever like, you know what, I need to, I, I've got a service over here that generates the, the shell HTML. Like I have an existing application. That's just how we do that. So you could actually call that service to get the shell HTML, like that, you know, the thing that wraps your app. And then mm -hmm. stick it as part of the response. And you're just like responsible for this little piece inside of that. Uh, your Remix app is responsible for that piece. Uh, that's totally possible. And, and people are doing that. Um, so like, and you don't have to go to the docs to figure out how to do that because it's just looking at you right in the face um, yeah. with, with the way that this API works. So yeah. it's pretty cool. That is another thing I think to point out too, is that Remix uses a lot of web standards. So a lot of the things you're going to be able to look up on the MDN docs and just use things that are already web standards. Yes. Yeah, precisely. That that new response on line 17, that response is an HTTP um, web fetch API response thing. Um, so yeah, you're absolutely right. Looking at MDN instead of Remix.run docs. Um, which I think is cool. And then uh, entry.client, uh, same sort of thing, just for the client. So once the uh, JavaScript is all loaded on the page, uh, we're going to hydrate. And again, with React 18, um, we immediately supported a hydrate root and all of the, the new APIs uh, there as well uh, for streaming, which is pretty, pretty cool too. So, and you're in charge of that too. So if you need to set up some sort of analytics before um, hydrating, or if you like anything you need to do before hydration happens, or you need to wrap the Remix browser with your own context thing or whatever, you just do it all right here. And there's no, it, there's no API to learn. There's no, it's just, this is the convention. Yeah, you figure that out in two seconds, like it's generated for you. And then you can Would modify it. Would that have any performance implications if you put in analytics before it hydrated? Um, so, yeah, that's, that's a great question. So um, let's let's say that your analytics uh, thing takes like three seconds to initialize. Yeah, that's not going to be great. But let's say that that's, <laughs> you know, sometimes <laughs> that is that way. <laughs> uh, analytics is the worst. But um, let's say that's the case. Because Remix um, is so involved in uh, progressive enhancement, um, as like the app works before the JavaScript is finished running, um, then most of the app will work. Uh, in fact, the entire app, like the entire Facebook's app uh, that we're kind of 
semi working in here, um, the entire thing will work even um, before the JavaScript is finished loading. Now, if your uh, analytics thing does take three seconds and it's actually doing work, then the user's experience is going to be really bad. Like they're going to scroll and it's going to be janky and it's not going to be good. But so like speed that up. <laughs> but, is there, yeah. Is there any native way to in inside of Remix, I guess, to defer the loading of the analytics till everything else is hydrated and done? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, like your analytics is going to be whatever your analytics is. I uh, I just use that as an example. Um, I just know that like those sometimes need to happen before hydration for some weird yeah. reason. So um, yeah, there's there's no built in way with uh, uh, with Remix to like defer that. But like you can literally use a script uh, element and say defer and, and all say that, defer. If that's okay. Uh, and and you could also put it in here. And if you don't need to wait until analytics are done before hydrating, like I don't actually don't know very many situations where you do need to wait um, for hydration before analytics can can go get going or whatever. But um, but yeah, in, in any case, um, the the fact is that you get the power uh, and the control and like real applications are messy and need that sort of um, capability and, and power. Yeah. Yeah, um, absolutely. I, and I should mention if you are in a situation where your analytics are like a real bottleneck for you, uh, then there's this really cool project called Party Town that will take- I was yeah. going to say that and I didn't <laughs> want to diverge us even more, but yes, yeah. like Party Town is so cool. You can, you can talk about it. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, that's great. Uh, there, and there actually is an integration, uh, docs page on Party Town's, um, docs on how to integrate that with Remix and it works great. So. Oh, sweet. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. And so, the only other thing go. I wanted to point out too was the scripts. So we could just disable JavaScript. I know you, you showed me this before. So if you wanted to disable JavaScript, you could just take that out and it actually turns off the JavaScript for your site. Yeah, yeah. Really There's cool. just no JavaScript to be loaded. Um, yeah. And the, the whole site should work. Um, now, the and that's all thanks to progressive enhancement. Remix understands how the browser will submit forms when their uh, event.prevent default isn't called and stuff. Um, and, uh, yeah, the, there are certainly some things that require JavaScript to work, like lots of date pickers and stuff like that. But if you're thinking about progressive enhancement, you can build experiences that will work without JavaScript. Um, and, uh, if that's the way that you want it to be. And, uh, if you wanted to, you could actually remove that component and then add like little script tags in different places, um, and do like the sprinkle JavaScript thing that we used to you do. You can do native, like, yeah. And, and of course, like, like we were saying to defer, so you could just throw a defer in mm -hmm. there and put your, yep. Yeah. And of course this is JSX. So you can't just put JavaScript in that script tag. You have to do the dangerously set inner HTML nonsense and all that stuff. But, but yes, uh, you could totally uh, do the sprinkle JavaScript stuff that we used to do back in the PHP days and whatever. I mean, I, I shouldn't say back in the PHP. A lot of people are still doing that, but, um, right. but yeah. Um, back when that was a lot more popular than it is today. So. So yeah, that is a little bit of the, the setup of everything. Yeah, that's that's kind of the background. So we talked a little bit about the routes and how making a file inside of this routes directory is going to create that route for you. So mm -hmm. we, I, we actually have routes for all of these. We have the home, sign up, login, and sign up is actually the join route and then mm -hmm. customers. And we have a logout, which is just going to log us out. And I did take the time to actually go ahead and create an account and we can see the... Um, the notes app that comes with the K-pop stack actually working also. So we're going to have this and we're also going to have this fake books side site too. So we're going to mm. have two, two sites in one here. So I think what we're, we're going to start working on now is talking about nested routing a little bit and get into this customer's route and create this form that goes with this fake book site, if that's okay with you. Yeah, let's do it. Sounds great. Okay, so we've got this customers.tsx route, and that is what is showing here. And here's the markup for that. There's obviously Tailwind classes throughout this. We've got a nav link, which is going to create the new customer, but we don't have any of this set up yet. Yeah. So should we go ahead and get started setting up some of the other routes? Yeah, absolutely. So um, do you want to do the form first, or do you want to make routes for the customer, like specific customers first? Let's do, um, so we have like the dynamic route and then, mm -hmm. uh, then let's make the new form. Okay, route. sweet. So when you click on one of those customers, um, go ahead and give that a, a whirl. Um, you're going to get the 404, but you'll look at the URL. We already have the link sending it to where it should go. And that should be customer slash the customer ID. 
And so to make that work with the convention-based, file-based routing that Remix has, you go into that routes directory, and we're going to create a new folder called customers. And so these will all. this is where we'll put all of the child routes for the customer route. So a child route would be um, every segment of the URL is like um, another folder here. Mm -hmm. So we've got our customers. Now we need to have a route for, uh, let, let's actually, let's add our index route. So um, where we are right now, we're at slash customers. We're not on any particular customer. So um, we're, we're just showing a blank white screen on the right there. Um, if we add an index route, now we can control what shows up in that little blank spot over there. Yeah. So here you'll want to export a component, uh, and that's what will um, we'll stick into that slot. Oops, default, right? Yeah, default function, yep. And what are we going to call We could call this the customer's index. That's probably what I would call it. Uh, maybe route if you wanted to. Uh, it, it doesn't need a name, but it makes debugging easier if it has one. And then what are we going to put in here? Um, I would probably just, um, what I do in the actual fake books app is I actually have just a loader in here that redirects to the first customer because there's like, why would anybody want to see anything else? But for our purposes, I think it's useful. Uh, so let's just do a, a, a P tag that uh, says like, please choose a customer or something. Okay. Cool. You save that and we will have to do a manual reload because we had an application error. So there we go. So it says, please choose a customer. We could add, yeah, there you go. It's Tailwind classes to make it look nice. Yes, yeah, um, just, just something, give it a little padding there. Just, make yeah, it... just a little bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It kind of makes you itch if you don't. Do yes. It right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but let's go to the customer's TSX file just to, to make sure people understand why is that please choose a customer showing up where it is. And if you scroll down, there's the outlet right there. Yeah, you got it. Uh, and so w parent routes are responsible for uh, the data that they need, the like actions that they can perform uh, with like forms and stuff we'll look at later, as well as the UI that they're responsible for. And if that parent route is going to have children, then we need to render this outlet that says, where in the layout does that child go? And so that's what we're doing with this outlet component. And so now when we're on customers and we don't have any uh, other um, uh, segments to the URL, then Remix says, oh, okay, you are rendering an outlet. Um, I will render your index route in that outlet because you don't have any other uh, segments in the URL. Yeah, so it's like a, a slot in some other popular frameworks. You might yeah. see that, or children in, in Next or something like that. Yeah, Transclusion for those AngularJS uh, OGs out there. Um, <laughs> and Gtransclude. Um, yeah, the good times. And and actually, that that is a apt um, comparison because with transclusion or, or with slots in view, you can have as many as you want. Uh, with React, um, you only have one child. Uh, you, it can be an array of children, but you only have one. Uh, but you can have additional props that could be like, here's my left nav, here's my right nav, here are the elements for those. Um, with, uh, with a router, though, you cannot be on two routes at once. And so um, the outlet component is a lot more like transclusion, which could only have one, one thing in there. Um, because it, it, you can render as many outlets as you like. And if you tried, you'd get, please choose a customer like three times. <laughs> um, and, but, but we can uh, actually like render another outlet and it would just put it down below. Interesting. Yeah, exactly. So um, the, I can't think of a really like real world use case where you'd ever do something like that, um, render multiple outlets, but yeah. yeah. I'm glad you pointed that out because that was some a question that I had. Like I use Svelte a lot. So Svelte has slots and you can name the slots and then you can, so it's like a prop of name and you can put different multiple slots. So then mm -hmm. you would have a, a name for this customer and a name for the, I don't know why you would do that, but yeah. Just so you could have multiple outlets without it being the same thing, but this will not work that way. No, and and it wouldn't. Uh, there wouldn't be a use case for it because yeah. the way that the URL works, there's just it's impossible to be in two places at once. Um, yeah. And but that said, uh, React is still capable of doing that as well. With just instead of using children, you just use named props, and you can pass mm -hmm. JSX elements to that too. So. Um, and, and so that that would work like if you had a component that needed uh, the slots kind of capability. Yeah, you can make that component. And I, I guess I should mention also for folks who are like, yeah, but I don't like React. Like we are um, actively working on making uh, support for other frameworks in the future as well.
I know Austin Krim is working on the remix router Svelte and I'm very excited. I'm going to be co-emceeing Svelte Summit coming up and there he's doing the talk there on it. So Ooh. I'm very excited to see where that's going. Uh, that's very cool. Very cool. But that said, since we're talking about this, Brittany, how has it been the last couple of weeks using React with remix? You know, I, I'm going to say like, I'm not really a big fan of the DX of React when I have to use use state and use effect. I've been using Remix for two weeks and I have not written a single use state or use effect, which is incredible. And it makes it so much nicer and cleaner for me just in my brain, like not having to think about that client side state. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I love it. <laughs> I <think laughs> that's great. So it really, for me, Remix turns React into a template. Uh, that's all like it, it there you certainly there are use cases for state management and stuff and if mm -hmm. you go to the full fake books thing um, you you end up having um, we have one example where you create a new invoice and you have this thing you can type in and it'll uh, filter down customers and stuff and um, that yeah you're gonna need state for as they're typing and stuff but that kind of state is like really easy um, it's the application state stuff that that is really really hard um, I, I should, I shouldn't use the words easy or hard. Um, it is more complicated. Um, <laughs> it's hard to not say those words yeah. sometimes because it, it does and it's hard not to say them, but yeah. that's true, I guess. Yeah. Okay, cool. So we've got the index route. So when, when we're on just customers, this is what's going to show up next. We want to make it so that when we select a specific customer that that customer's details shows up over there in that outlet. So we're going to make another child route uh, module, which will go in that customer's directory. And we're going to use Remix a special convention for parameterized routes because we don't want to make like a route for, you know, a file for every possible ID, which like that doesn't we make need any it to sense. Be dynamic. Yeah, yeah, we need it to be dynamic. So we're going to use a dollar sign and then customer ID um, camel case to um, identify that this is a parameterized route and the parameter is called uh, customer ID. Okay. And so does this name match up to something? Does it need to be named correctly to match yeah, up it, to that? It will match up to the params, um, the object that you get in your loader, yep. as well as in the use params hook in your components. Um, and so you can call it whatever you like. It's, it's up to you. You just need to make sure that you match that when you're in your code. Um, okay. And again, that's all just convention stuff. Um, what this ends up doing, actually, you know, it's interesting. Uh, why don't you open up the terminal? And I'll, I can show you, no, sorry, <laughs> in the, in your. Oh, uh, oh, oh, yeah. that, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just in a new thing, yeah. If you run NPX remix routes, then this is going to show you the configuration. Like uh, you'll need a space between remix and routes instead of hyphen. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. So um, the remix CLI for yeah. routes. Yeah. So this, if you expand that window a bit, um, this will show you the router configuration that's uh, being generated based on your file system. And so you'll see there's one route there for customer ID. Um, that's just generated based on what you called the file. So you could change that file to be anything else and it would update um, to be whatever you called it. Um, okay. And so, yeah, if you're familiar with React Router and, and that can, um, you know, JSX based routing, this is effectively what that uh, kind of looks like, except with the file prop, which is not a React Router thing. So if you're ever like, I'm kind of lost, like how do I structure this properly? I know how to do this with React Router. I just don't know how to do this with the file convention. You try things and then play around with it and, and uh, use the remix routes command. Very cool. So. Yeah, I like that. Cool. All right. So for the customer ID, the easiest thing to do would just be to do a default export of a component uh, that just renders, um, you know, hello world or whatever, uh, just to make sure we have that it's, wired properly. It's the customer. Yeah, probably customer, um, customer route, I guess. Okay. And and then you, you said just hello world in there. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be sufficient, I think. Hello work instead of hello world. Hello oh, work. <laughs> so now if we go to a customer, we're going to actually get, and we probably want to do. Yeah, let's let's get that some padding. I'll actually <laughs> give you um, what I have in the finished version so that you can just use that. Um, oh, and... sweet. I, I think I may have it already if it's the same one that we created before. Yeah, I, I actually, I may have some slight differences oh, in cool. what I okay. just mentioned. Um, and I am going to include the catch boundary there at the bottom. We can talk about that a little bit too. 
Where did that go to? Uh, I put it in Discord. Oh, just kidding. I sent it to my wife. She's going to be very confused. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I didn't get anything. I thought it was going to Discord. Was <laughs> she's she's going to be like, what the heck? <laughs> she's, she's like, okay, That's going to be a fun thanks. conversation later. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> okay. So I can just copy and paste that directly yeah, into this file? Yeah, just copy and paste that to the whole file, yeah. Okay. Oh, and so we'll need to take care of those imports for use, catch, and use brands, uh, yeah. as well as, yeah. Man, I always do this. I did this last time, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so let's see. We've got... Um, here, I'll I've give got... you a bunch. This will be probably more than you need. Um, but uh, I've got some. Yeah, I'll give you a bunch that you can bring in there for now. And yeah, and it looks like you don't have the utils file either. That's the currency formatter. Gosh dang it. <laughs> you probably do have a utils, but probably not the currency formatter. So I'll send you that. Um, as well as a couple and other so utilities. So that utils file is, I do have a utils file, but maybe yeah. not. Yeah, just and... click that at the bottom of the utils file. Okay. There we go. Cool. Sweet. So um, now this is just complaining about the customer info function and a couple other things. So we'll use in the loader later. So uh, we don't need to worry about that. Uh, that's all TypeScript warnings and stuff. Okay. Um, and then for the, oh shoot. Yeah, we've got that data, uh, that loader data stuff. So for that, um, let's just do, because um, I, I don't want to write the loader yet. I want to just like, let's get the UI going. Yeah. Um, so can we, well, the data is in there though. Yeah. So we just take <laughs> this out, but we can't okay. without the data. So let's just pretend that uh, like th this does, well, I mean, we, we don't need to pretend like it. We saw that it was already showing. So here's the UI. We, we made the UI. Um, now let's talk about how we're going to load the data. Okay. So, um, and then we'll talk about that catch boundary once we get the data loading. And um, I saved that and that's why it broke for a yeah, second. So we'll it. fix that in just a second here. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Okay. So for loading data, um, we have that loader function we saw earlier in the customer parent route for loading the data for the, um, the customers on the left side. So now we need to load not only like their name, and their email, but also uh, like their, um, their details, like the specific uh, details of that customer, the invoice details and things. Mm -hmm. So um, for that, there are a couple of things we need to, uh, to do. First, you're going to export a, an async function. Uh, I'd put it right above the line item class name uh, just to keep that UI. Above it? Yeah. And so you'll oh, that's, say, so that's import... classes that you're reusing. That's how I keep my Tailwind classes cleaner too. Yeah, yeah. Um, so export async function. Sorry. No, it looks nothing. like you were about to say something. So. Oh, no. <laughs> I was just listening. Yeah. <laughs> I was listening carefully to what you were you were telling me to write. Yeah, so, so. you got the loader. Uh, this one is we are going to need both the uh, request and the params. Okay, so we're pulling them off, right? We're destructuring them. Yeah, and the request will be the full name request rather than just oh, yeah. uh, rec. That is yeah. such habit for me. Oh yeah, totally. You you code in Express, I see. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, right. Yeah. So actually, if you scroll up to the top on line one, we're importing a type called loader args. So that's the type for the arguments of our loader there. Okay. Loader args. Sweet. And now the responsibility of our loader is to return a response. And it can be anything. It you can be a, a redirect, it can be uh HTML response, it could be whatever you want. But in in typical use cases, it's either gonna be a redirect or it's going to be um, a JSON response. Like that, most of the time, that's what it, you're, you're going to want. And so that's the case for us. We're going to return a JSON response. Um, and so, yeah, you can return that JSON. And uh, it, it's important to call out that that JSON um, function is just a utility. There's nothing really fancy about it other than it helps us from having to set the content type like every time we want to do this and serializing to JSON and stuff. Okay, this is something that someone brought up in a stream when I was working with Remix and they said that they didn't think you had to do this anymore and it did work without it. But mm -hmm. we saw earlier that the types like didn't pass through correctly if we weren't using it. So it just right. kind of streamlines the... The types, yeah. And in fact, um, so at the, the beginning, you would just return an object and, and uh, Remix would you know, serialize that and do this JSON thing for you. And um, that 
um, that works, but you can't set headers. You can't like, you're really limited on what you can do when it's just that. And uh, and then when we added the type inference stuff, that type of loader uh, stuff we've got, um, it, that does didn't work. Uh, you have to have the JSON response. Um, okay. And I actually prefer using JSON anyway. Um, and so in the uh, next major version bump of, of Remix, we will remove uh, the ability to just return whatever you want. Um, it needs to be a response. Okay. So, because um, it's just better. It's um, in every way. So, um, okay, sweet. So JSON expects, you know, some JSON, uh, some yeah. actual data. And so uh, for us, uh, and actually, my I think my customer server code is a little different because you don't have that get customer info. And that's actually fine because mine, uh, I, I just remembered, has like some extra demo stuff. So you can actually, oh, okay. on that line five, get, get rid of the get customer info import and uh, just the customer details is all that you need. Okay. And so um, what we need now is we're going to get the customer details, but we need to know which customer this is. And so uh, uh, just above that return JSON, let's go get that customer um, with okay. get customer details. So yeah, you can say cost customer details. Oh wait, customer details. And then we're going to await get customer details. And we need to pass it. Yeah, you pass the, ID, it the customer right? ID. And so that, that customer ID is um, what we get from the params. So that params object has all of the params that are currently active on uh, on this route. And the current route is um, the uh, customer slash customer ID. And because we called this file customer ID, that's what Remix has configured this param to be called. Okay. Um, the reason it's complaining is because customer ID at runtime could potentially be undefined. Um, Conventionally, that will never happen, but TypeScript doesn't understand the convention. And so if you want to, uh, you can just slap this. Here, I'll, I'll copy this over to you. Um, slap this in, and uh, that will make TypeScript happy. Um, we don't need to dive too much into that. Um, That's above this yeah. line? Yep, right okay. there. Now, now it's happy. So basically, what will happen is if customer ID is not a string, then an error will be thrown. And so the next line can't possibly run. So TypeScript is happy about that. Um, and this actually, even without TypeScript, this is probably a good idea because like, what if somebody changed the name of this file? Now all of a sudden you're gonna get, cannot read customer ID of undefined, uh, not as helpful as params.customerID is not available, right? So yeah. you're, get, you're getting some runtime help there, which I think is, is worthwhile. That is, yeah. So cool, all right. So now we've got the customer details and for people watching that get customer details is like, that's all implementation detail stuff. Nothing to do with Remix. We're just calling Superbase and saying, hey, go get me the details for this customer. Yep. So it's it's actually just running in one of those server files, like just JavaScript, right? Yep, exactly. So So yeah, let's pass along the customer. Oh, go ahead. Uh, we just need to return this as JSON. So we need to call it customer, and then we need to um, pass the customer details. Yeah, and uh, the JSX that I gave you um, is not quite what it should be. So uh, I'm gonna give you some updated JSX that okay. will make this better. Um, so this will be uh, just take the entirety of that uh, customer uh, route function and paste this on top of that. Okay, so this entire function here. And uh, not including the not the catch. Want to keep the catch boundary around. Gotcha. Paste. Okay, cool. So that just uh, fixed that. Oh, and instead of customer on line 17, let's just call it customer details. Okay, so just that. Yeah. Uh, okay. And oh, yeah. So the reason that it's giving you an error now is because that actually could be null. And so um, for now, what I want you to do is we're gonna um, do invariant on the uh, customer details to say, hey, if it's null, then let's just throw an error. Um, and so you can do invariant uh, type of customer details uh, is not equal to null and otherwise. Does that um, go here? It'll go uh, below the- I'll move it after yeah. I fix it. So. Uh, what what was the message? Yeah, you can call it, have it be whatever you want. Um, we're we're gonna get rid of this soon anyway, uh, but it, this is just to get us there. 
And where did you decide to put this? Yeah, put it right below the declaration before the JSON. Yeah, there yeah. we go. Cool. And then uh, the type of customer details, you want to say not equal to null. Um, and Not, not a equal. Yeah. Not a cool. string. Perfect. Great. Oh, it's not about null. Invalid oh, sorry. Type Actually, of uh, no, that, that should be working. So if you could hover over, what is that complaining about? Invalid, Invalid. type of comparison. Oh, yeah. Okay. Remove the type of. There we go. Now everything is happening. We'll <laughs> now a, there's no more red lines. We'll, we'll do this better here in a, a little bit, but um, but this should actually work. If you save this and, and go to the um, to the app now. And now if we refresh, we should be able to bring up. Yep, there you go. Oh. Oh, that's weird. Oh, we're getting one of the, the database errors. Interesting. <laughs> this was just working. Uh oh, what is? I have no idea what happened. I'm gonna shut down the server and see if that will fix it. Hopefully. So I've never used Supabase before, <laughs> um, but uh, okay, good. <laughs> Hopefully we don't have any more trouble because I, yeah. Yeah, I don't have any experience with Supabase. Uh, cool. So. I, I was just gonna make sure that the other ones worked. I was like, yeah. I wonder if all the data <laughs> didn't go in there or something. But that that was super super weird. I'm glad that that's working now. Super uh, weird. Oh wow. So, uh, why don't we expand the the code again, and we'll we'll talk through some of what's going on. Yeah. Uh, and then we can talk about um, what to a better way to handle the no customer found case. Okay. So uh, if we go to that loader, um, let's just walk through what's going on with that code. Also, we want to talk about um, authorizing the user, uh, and that'll come next. So line 10, we're just pulling the customer ID out of the params. Then we're making sure that it's available because somebody could change the name of this file, and now the thing's totally busted, and we want, just want to have a better error message for them. Also, we want to make TypeScript happy. Um, <laughs> um, and then, yeah, exactly. Uh, and then line 16, we're calling uh, get customer details. Again, that's all just like Supabase. We're not here to talk about Supabase necessarily. Uh, so that's all hidden behind. And what that does is it takes the customer ID and gives us all the details for that customer, their invoices and their name and email and all that stuff. Um, and then line 17 is just make sure that the, we did get a customer back. We'll make that better in a second. And then we re return a response um, and that JSON is just a helper to make a new response that will serialize what we give it and set the right headers for it to be JSON. So that is what we did. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think pointing out that like we're not worried about the Supabase implementation shows kind of the power of how you can just drop in these different databases, kind of like a headless setup where you can, it doesn't matter. You can just switch out your backend. Totally, and uh, like, um, my website uses 12 services at least. Wow. Yeah. So I, I've got uh, my own Postgres. I've got a Redis thing. I have an in-memory cache, actually. Um, I am using two podcast services, actually. <laughs> um, the Call Kent podcast uses Transistor and the Chats with Kent podcast uses Simplecast. So I, I'm integrating with both of those APIs. Uh, I, I integrate with the GitHub API to go get all my content because all my stuff's in Markdown on GitHub. Um, I, I've got uh, a service for validating email addresses. I integrate with ConvertKit. I integrate with Discord. So like all of the things, and it all just happens in this loader. Um, no, yeah, no and you can just um, search and replace and like just take it out and yeah. replace yeah, I it just, with something. I stick it over in this file that's like responsible for interacting with that API. And then I just call, call that. And I can have like caching implemented over there and everything. It's all like isolated in that one module. And it doesn't, it is... Uh, what, what's the opposite of a leaky abstraction? Airtight. <laughs> it's it's nice. Um, so, no leaks. Yeah, yeah nice. no leaks. And it doesn't matter where that data is coming from. And this is this is the reality for most people building apps today, uh, at least in the enterprise, is they're integrating with tons of services, internal services. Um, yeah. And so being able to have a, a clean, easy, consistent way to do that um, is really, really valuable. I would like... So I so wish that I had this when I was at PayPal. Uh, it would have drastically simplified so much of what we were doing. Nice. So. Yeah. Cool. Uh, okay. So why don't the first thing I want to do is um, um, make sure that only authenticated users can look at this because, mm -hmm. like, clearly you wouldn't want unauthenticated users to access your data, right? So on the line right above ten, the first line of our loader, we're going to use that require user. 
um, function. That's an async function. So you'll say await require user. We actually don't care to get the user. Um, often you will, like you'll say, get this user's customer. So you will actually want to get that user and then pass that along to get customer details or something like that. Um, but for us, uh, we all we want to do is just make sure that this request has a user associated to it. Yeah. So you just pass the request uh, to that function. And uh, this is not a, a remix thing. This is implemented as part of the app. Uh, and you could dive into it if you want to. But all that it's doing is it um, checks the cookie, gets the user ID out of the cookie, and then gets the user out of the database to make sure that that um, user ID is valid and all that. Um, Do we need to set that to a variable or anything? No, we're not going to use no. it. So what? Okay. actually, if you do dive into require user, uh, let's see what happens when, um, when we don't get a user. So uh, first, if there's no user ID, we're just going to return null. Um, we should probably, oh, actually, no. So if you go to require user ID, uh, dive in on line 65. Um, 65, this one? Yeah, so that require oh, and, user ID and, function. Okay, yeah. yeah, let's dive into that. So um, we're gonna get the user ID. That's another utility that, like, ult eventually we get to like getting the cookie and then uh, reading um, the user ID out of that. Um, but uh, if there is no user ID, then we actually um, throw a redirect. That redirect on line fifty-eight is um, actually another utility similar to JSON that will. Um, uh, that will just generate create a response object, uh, a web fetch response object, and all that it has is uh, just uh, it has a body of null because you don't need a, a body for a redirect, and then um, it has the headers for location, and then it's whatever you pass here. So our location will be slash login uh, with the search params that tells um, you know where we want to send the user back to once they've logged in. So, so because we're passing in the request, they can they can get this off the request. Yep, yep, exactly. And so that way the user can get back to where they were working. So like, let's say uh, you your colleague sends you a link to the customer ID you know, page. And so you go there and you're not logged in. So we're gonna send you to the login, you log in, and now it will send you back to where you were before. So that's how you would implement something like that. Um, and that actually, that all of that is built into uh, all of the stacks. Um, so yeah, that's that's what's going on with require uh, the user. If if you don't have an authenticated user on the request, then we'll just send you over there. And, and uh, so by throwing that response, uh, Remix is going to catch that and it'll say, "Is this a response?" Oh, it is. Okay, I will do. I will send that response. And the rest of our code, lines eleven through 20, uh, 21, are not going to run because it was a throw. Um, oh, okay. We don't have to worry about it, and so now. So we know Remix that... just knows there to stop because it threw a redirect or an error, or it threw something, mm -hmm. so it stops yeah. there. Yep, and that's just a, like JavaScript feature, right? Like you yeah. throw something, and now we're not going to run the rest. Um, but uh, but yeah, once Remix catches a response, then it's like, oh, okay, I'll just do what this response does. So what what actually is going to happen when your colleague sends you that? You click on the link. We actually have a loader for the customer route as well. Right, because the parent route is loading the list of customers, um, and we also have like the the root route has a loader as well. So we're actually running all three of those in uh, concurrently, um, and so as soon as any of those throws a redirect, then um, Remix is like, oh, okay, forget about all this stuff. We're gonna actually send uh, redirect the user over here. Yeah. So to just kind of showcase that too, like this side is running from this customer's route here. And so we're getting this loader function just for this. And then the index file is running just if we don't have a customer selected. And then this dynamic route, it's running this loader function for this section of the site. Yeah, precisely. And in fact, we have one more, and that's the root route. Uh, and that's the, the nav up at the top that's being oh, yeah. uh, run. And that's, that's actually loading the user. So it's, the user can be accessible by all of the components on the page. So you don't have to like load the user in every single one of these. Nice. That said, um, it's important to note that because all of these run uh, independently and because they're all, um, you can actually run that. So because they're all running concurrently and they can actually be run independently because as you choose different customers, we don't run them all. Um, we just run the, the, the route that's changed. Um, mm -hmm. You have to protect every one of them. Um, so if any of them has data that you don't want unauthenticated users to access, you need to consider the fact that a person could actually curl your endpoint for that route 
and get all that data. So you, every one of these needs to be protected, which is um, one of the areas that uh, is like not a great DX uh, for Remix right now. It's because like, I don't want to have to remember to protect all those. That's stupid. Um, <laughs> so um, there are a couple of solutions for this. Uh, one, first, I'll just say that we are actually going, uh, going to have a really good solution for this um, that will involve uh, a... Not not middleware because middleware is the worst. Like if you've ever worked with middleware at scale, it it, it is so bad. Um, it's great like for simple little things, but yeah, it's not fun at all. So we have a, a way better solution um, in mind, but I'm not going to describe it because we don't like talking about things we haven't shipped yet. Um, okay. so, <laughs> but Just we, know it's coming. <laughs> no, something is coming for that for sure. Um, but even before that comes, if this is a, a thing that really bothers you, then you could actually integrate. Um, this with some other um, uh, server thing like in Express or um, even before, like with Netlify, there is a, a part of your code. Uh, I think you've got a server uh, a TS in there somewhere um, it, outside of the app directory, actually. Um, yeah, I think there's a server somewhere. Um, yeah, well, there, yeah, there it is, the server.js. Oh, server.js, there. there we go. Um, so this is, we've got the create request handler. We're using uh, Netlify, a um, bunch of stuff going on in here. You could actually, that that get load context potentially could be used for this, maybe. Um, but um, there, you have an integration point that you could say, hey, before I even call into Remix, let me make sure the user's logged in because I know they're going to a route they need to be logged in. And so then, then you can get them out of there. So there are workarounds for this if this really bothers you. Um, but it's just really important to know that the only way that Remix can be as fast as it is is because it runs all of those concurrently and it runs them independently as the user is navigating around. And so you need to uh, consider uh, protecting each individual loader because they can be called independently. That's a good call out, yeah. So, okay, cool. So that's that's protecting the route. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is on line uh, 18, that invariant. So. Before we actually change that code, I want you to go to the app and just change the ID, the customer ID to like anything else. Just add like a queue at the end or something. And now we get this application error. It says invariant failed, customer details not available. Um, great. That's just the message. Yeah, that's okay. the message we gave. Like that's exactly what happened. Um, the invariant throws an error. This is expected. However, I actually think that is a bad user experience. Um, <laughs> and so what would be way cool is if we could actually um, instead, we um, return uh, or, or uh, give a, a response. And so we can render some UI that says, hey, this customer is not available. Yes. And so at the bottom of the page uh, of this um, uh, file, I gave you the catch boundary. And that catch boundary has um, is already pre-configured to, to show that. No customer found with the ID of the customer ID, whatever. Um, so a couple of hooks in here, the use params, that's a React router thing uh, that's been around forever. Um, and that'll just get all the params that are active on the page right now. So customer ID, that's what we call that. Uh, the use catch is a um, very f funny name, honestly, cot. What is a cot? Uh, I've got a cot. I lie down on it. Like, what is that? Um, but, but, uh, but what this is, is it's the a caught response. So you, you saw earlier how we threw a redirect. Now we're actually gonna throw some JSON, uh, or, or actually we don't even need to throw JSON. We don't care, all we care about is the status. If we throw a response that has a status code of 404, then we know that, hey, there's no customer here. So let's show the user some, uh, some useful stuff. Yes. So here I'll send you what I did. Um, instead of that invariant, you can stick that um, in place of the invariant. And so we're going to replace the invariant here yep. with that. And if there's no customer details, we're going to throw the new response 404. And now it should be save. And hopefully we don't get a new error. There we go. No customer found. There you go. And so and it didn't break the whole site. Yeah, exactly. You get it. <laughs> so now if you click on one of the other customers, you totally can. <laughs> and I didn't have to refresh. It didn't like take me out of the user experience. It just gave me a very valid message telling me what happened and then I can go about my day. Yeah, exactly. And the HTTP status code is correct. <laughs> so yes. the uh, search engines will be like, oh, this is uh, you know, 404. I'm not gonna stick that in there anymore. Or like all of the, the um, your browser actually behaves differently on, on 404s and stuff. So valid stat uh, status code for, on the server render 
um, and uh, and uh, a contextual error message doesn't break the rest of the app. Uh, and it's really quite straightforward. You just, if I don't have this thing, then let's throw this response and then my catch boundary will catch the thing I threw. And this is a remix standard too, to name it catch boundary. So you yes. just call a function catch boundary and, and do this stuff to return the 404 response. And then it will render that up here once you check for it. Yep. You got it. Exactly. Perfect. Cool. Okay. So it just occurred to me that I, I've been doing what I do best and that's talk about Remix forever. Um, I don't remember <laughs> if we had a time limit on this, but we're over an hour now um, and we haven't even gotten to forms yet. <laughs> I know. Yeah. So, so we have about two hours. So we have uh, okay. just under one more hour and yeah, so we have our dynamic data now. Do we want to start getting the form in here so we can yes. look at that? Yeah. So Absolutely. actually if you, before we do anything else in the app, if you go to create new customer, um, this is actually going to be kind of interesting. No customer found with the idea of new. <laughs> because um, um, when you add a dynamic param, it's going to say anything at this URL segment uh, goes into this route. And so we've configured this route to check for a customer of whatever the customer ID is, and the customer ID is new. Um, so and what I we was can... trying to find where the... Where's oh, yeah, the create yeah. the, new customer? The create new it, customer link right there. Yeah. yeah, right here. So it's this nav link. Yeah. And we're we're navving it over to new, which uh, that's kind of fun. That's um, relative routes, something we've been wanting in React Writer for a long time. Uh, so we don't have to say slash customer slash new. We can just say new and it be, it'll be relative to wherever this nav link appears in the UI. Interesting. Okay. I was wondering why this was different than the link component, but this nav link component says a special uh, kind of is, link. Yeah. It, the only special thing about this is that class name can accept a function. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so that way you can uh, style it special if it's currently active. And that's what we do. If you look at create customer, it's like it got a darker background just so oh, people yeah. see. Oh, I should have. Nav link in my nav bar instead of regular links. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> then you can like highlight wh where you are. Yeah, it's yeah, weird. nice. Okay. So yeah, we're on the new page, um, but that is taking us to the customer ID route. We don't want it to do that, so we're going to make a new.tsx file in here. Okay, so new file and new.tsx, and we're still under. I don't think that we noted that this customers folder matches the customers route name, and that's what's making this nested routing happen. Correct. Yes, exactly. Okay, and let's see if we can get back. Yep. So we don't have a broken app on the screen. Yep, that's good. And I just sent you the, the JSX because again, perfect. We, we don't need to teach people how to do React in this live stream. <laughs> yeah, I, we would be here all day, I think, if we started trying <laughs> yeah. to do that. I think I copied something else too. Yeah, there we go. Okay, and cool. So there's one thing that I have that you don't. Let me grab that uh, for you. Looks like a couple of components. Yeah. There. So if you go, um, yeah, I'll probably give you more than you need, but if you create a components. I already um, have a components directory. So do I need to? Oh yeah. Let's just, I'll, I'll just grab the, um, let me see how much yeah, we just need these three things. Um, okay. So you can just paste this at the top of your file here and then delete the import for the components directory. There we go. Cool. That'll work. Okay, sweet. So if you save that and then uh, go to the new route now. Now we have a form. A form. Ta -da! React. Yay. HTML. <laughs> yeah. So uh, great. So with this, now um, the first thing I want you to do is actually fill out the form and go to create customer. And, and actually pull up your network uh, tab as well so we can see what the network does with that. Forgot what I did. Is it plus? Oh, it, you you can, this isn't your user account. This would just be, call it whatever you want it to, to call it. Oh wait, this is my. <laughs> okay, so. So click create customer. And we're going to get a 405 method not allowed. So the reason that this happened is because we don't have any uh, uh, the the form. Actually, yeah, let's let's pull up the network tab. We'll look at that first. Um, so if you look at um, that second request that we made there, or uh, yeah, yeah, the second request. So we're getting a post request, 
Um, and if you go to the payload uh, tab, just uh, right there, and you'll see the form data has Brittany, Brittany plus remix, and intent create. So um, what's happening here is um, remix is actually simulating what the browser does. This is um, what the browser would do. Uh, is it takes all of the form inputs, serializes it into a form data object, which is web platform thing again. Mm -hmm. And then um, Remix will make a fetch request um, to your Remix server um, with that uh, data query string so that the Remix server knows, oh, this is the route that's supposed to handle this. And then on the server, it's like, okay, let me find that route. Oh, hold on a second. That route doesn't have an action. It cannot handle this post request. So I'm going to send back a 405 method not allowed. Okay, so we don't have an action set up for the form. It doesn't know where to go. Exactly, yeah. So let's look at the code really quick. I probably should have showed this earlier. Um, if you go down to that line, what line is it? 21, uh, where we have the form, uh, this is an uppercase form. So this uppercase form is coming from Remix. Um, it, so it's a component. Um, and it, we specify the method as post. The uppercase form is actually very similar to a regular form. Um, the, the only thing that it does differently is it uses an on submit handler, it uses event prevent default, and it does a fetch request instead of the like an actual form post. The reason that it does this is so that we can avoid the full page refresh, which is why we started doing event prevent default in the first place, is we don't want a full page refresh. Um, and so, but for everything else, the, the way the request looks, the uh, everything looks almost exactly the same as a regular, um, request. And then the way that you handle it on the server is exactly the same. Um, the, the way the request looks when you're on the server looks exactly uh, like a request, whether you're using a regular form or a remix form. The reason that you use the remix form is to avoid uh, the full page refresh. Refresh. And you can switch them out here. I know you've shown that before on stream. So you could use a lowercase form here and it would work just fine. Yeah. Well, yep. it wouldn't work yet because we don't have an action. But. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we would we would get the 405 method not allowed still. But yes, yes exactly. And um, uh, that's actually cool. This is uh, part of the progressive enhancement piece is that uppercase form will render a lowercase form. It'll render an HTML form. And what that uh, and because it's server rendering, um, you don't have to actually make any um, uh, affordances for making sure that this works before the JavaScript finishes loading or if the JavaScript fails to load or whatever. And that's that's progressive enhancement. It's um, let's say that uh, they went into a tunnel as, as soon as they loaded your page and it didn't finish loading the JavaScript and it failed. And then they come out of the tunnel after they finished filling in the form and they hit submit. The whole thing will work even though uh, they never ended up loading the JavaScript. It'll end up doing a full page refresh because it's a regular form. No prevent default is called or whatever. Um, but it will work and the Remix server will understand it. Yeah, and, and it's progressive enhancement being like it will, without JavaScript, they will give the user an experience that will progressively get better as the JavaScript comes in. Yep, exactly. It's pretty sweet. I've been trying to like manipulate that definition so I can actually explain it. <laughs> so <I'm like> try, <laughs> yeah. Trying to get better at that one. Yeah, yeah. Though I, something I've found in my, I guess my whole life is the more you talk about something, the better you get at talking about it. <laughs> Absolutely. So yeah, that's good. Okay, cool. So we do want to handle this because we want to be able to create a new um, customer. And so that is through another uh, conventional export on our route modules called Action. And it's very similar to Loader. So I'd put it on line two there. Uh, I'd say export async function Action. And this one, we are going to need the request. Um, and that's all, I, I, I believe, yeah, just the request. And um, for this one, like with the loaders, we have uh, loader args. This one will have action args. OK. And that comes from, is it going to automatically import yeah. this? Yes. There we go. Nice. Hallelujah. Uh, it's complaining because <laughs> this is a type import. And it's like, you, you know, oh, you type. import type. And it does, yeah. Yeah. Kind of Silly. <laughs> it's like you auto imported it for me. Could you? Yeah, why couldn't you? Like, right? You knew this, right? Like you're the one yelling at me. <laughs> right, exactly. It's like you did it wrong. No, no, you did it wrong. <laughs> okay, exactly. cool. Um, and, and I should note, like, we are using TypeScript in this project, but there's actually very little stuff that's TypeScript in the code that we're writing. 
There is. Yeah. I, I actually appreciate the amount of TypeScript. Like I, I mentioned earlier, it doesn't make the code more verbose and it makes it easy to parse and see. And then it just adds that type safety. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So, so nice. And if you weren't copy pasting the um, JSX, <laughs> then we'd be able to see like, it's super nice to have that autocomplete. Like, uh, it's so, so helpful. Oh yeah. The IntelliSense that just pops in and like allows you to complete everything is really nice. Yeah. Okay, great. So first of all, um, we do not want unauthenticated users to be able to create new customers. That would be silly. And so we're going to use that require user uh, utility here again. And that should um, auto import for you as well. So if you just do- That was uh, this one, yeah, right? One. Yep. And so if you command uh, period on that, then that should allow you to import that. Uh, you got to click on it and then command period. Yep, that's the one. There we go. Sweet. So now only authenticated users can perform this action. Remember, it's not just your app that can make a request to do this. People could curl that URL and all of that. So you do want to make sure you protect these, um, these mutations that can be made. OK, so the next thing that we're going to do is um, we are going to cr uh, get the form data out of the request. And okay. again, this request is a regular web fetch request object. And we um, web fetch request objects um, actually have a way to um, get the, the body of a specific type. So you might be familiar with request.json or response.json. Um, request also has a, a JSON uh, function um, or request.text. Um, there's also a request.form data. And so you can say, hey, uh, get my form data via await request.form data. And that's what we're going to do. Data and it's a function. Yep. And what's really cool is form data is a web platform API that, like, you could open up your browser uh, uh, console and say new form data, and like that's in the browser. Um, it's also here in Node, the same API. Um, so it's basically like we we teleported from the client to the server, and that's like that's the entire experience of working with Remix is you feel like you're teleporting from one side of your app to the other. Like your app consists of both the client and the server together. And so being able to take something and instantly have it over here, or at least that's the way it feels when you're coding, it's really nice. And knowing that it's going to run only on the server and not on the client, which you said the loader does, does this action also only run on the server? Yes, precisely. And uh, we'll, we'll see something else that's really cool that Remix does with this uh, once we're, we're finished. Um, Awesome. Yeah, I will look forward to that. So um, <laughs> so we've got our form data. Now we can get the stuff out of the form data that we want. Um, okay. So when, when you create a new customer, you need their name and their email. And uh, I'm going to actually do uh, grab this stuff for you just to make it a little easier. And because, um, yeah, typing is um, <laughs> we can talk about the code when once we've got it in there. So, so we don't have invariant imported. I need to grab that. Oh, yeah, that too. Ooh. Cool. All right, so let's talk about this. Form data dot get. So um, form data, the, uh, it has a, a, um, any number of properties. We don't know what those properties could be. Uh, so we're going to use this dot get API to get things by their name. Again, this is 100% web platform API. So if you're like, why isn't that just an object? Well, that's why, because, uh, well, that's one reason. It's a web platform API. The other reason is you can actually have multiple inputs in a form that have the same name. And mm -hmm. like, that's totally valid. And there are good reasons to do that. And so, um, and in fact, in fake books, we actually do that. So uh, when you create a, a new invoice, you can have multiple line items. And so you just have a bunch of things of the same name. Uh, and so uh, if we were to continue to build this out, yeah, we would say, get all. And so you say, get me all of the things that are uh, named name or, uh, uh, yeah, th I think that's what those. And then uh, you would be able to map over them. Yep. Yep. And just iterate over those to, to put it together in objects and stuff. Um, the other uh, thing is if you really do want to turn this into an object, you can by using form data dot entries and then use object up from entries. Oh, okay. And now you've got an object, but then you lose the ability to have like multiple of the same name. Right. So the other thing is that dot get can return three things. It can either be null because it wasn't set. 
It could be a string uh, because that's typically what these things are going to be. Or it can be a, um, a file because people can upload files. And, upload files. and so, um, yeah, so that's why we have on a, lines 11 and 12, we have that invariant um, to make sure that these are a string because Actually they should be who, uh, like, who knows what they could be? One of those other two things. You never know what your users are going to try to put in there. Yeah, yeah. And in, in this case, I think it's actually reasonable to do an invariant rather than sending back a, a more useful, like, UI. Because if if it's not a string, then you're the one who messed up. Because you're the one who's making the form. Like, um, you as the developer, you're the one who's yeah. making the form. And so... Um, yeah, it should be a string. Not and the so, end user. It's going to be the developer. Yeah, exactly. And and so I uh, I guess I, all I'd say is like it's pretty likely that um, something nefarious is going on. Like somebody is trying to hit curl your API or whatever. And so I don't I don't care throwing stupid errors at them. Um, <laughs> and on top of that, um, we can still give the UI a nice um, error um, for that. Uh, using an error boundary, which we don't have time to get into, but uh, okay. you just, it's very similar to the catch boundary. You put it at, at, in this route module export function error boundary, and then you say, if there's an unexpected error, this is where it goes. And we just, and it's still contextual. The rest of the app is still work, all that stuff. Yep. Cool. All right. So that create customer function, uh, you can uh, command dot that thing and uh, bring that, uh, import that. Yep, from customer server. Perfect. And now we've got our customer, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fingers crossed. <laughs> um, cool. And so now from here, I think it makes the most sense to redirect the them to the customer that they just created, right? So we'll return a redirect, um, yep, from Remix Run okay. Node to... And it automatically... No, it didn't. It was like, yeah, I think oh. it did. It did, uh, yep. yep. It's just that one was a type. I just saw the wrong one there. Yeah, and yeah. so we need to give it... Slash customers, right. slash customer ID. Yep. And slash customer... Dot ID. Dot ID. Yep, there you go. The app works. Uh, you should be able to save this, create a new customer by whatever name and email, and boom. And, and it worked. There it is. Okay, let's talk about a couple things here. Some really cool stuff just happened. Yeah. So this this was a web fetch, no no full re reload because uh, JavaScript is on the page, Remix is doing its thing. The UI updated. Yeah, okay. it related into a different route. Yeah. Who where where in our code did we say, hey, I want to update that list because I just made a new customer? We didn't. It just we didn't do that. I don't have to. <laughs> I don't think about that. Who cares? Like back in the, the good old multi-page app PHP days, you'd make a regular form, have your PHP like in the same file, like here's what, you know, what happens when they submit this form. And then um, the user would get redirected and you don't think about it because like they're going to go over to that page and that page is going to go read all the customers and, and generate the new HTML. So like you never thought about client side state management ever w back in those days. Yeah. And Remix is remixing that beautiful... Um, mental model with the modern like web fetch stuff that we can do. This remix is remixing. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's exactly, that's what the name is all about is uh, taking that mental model that was just so easy um, back in those days and, uh, and bringing it to the modern uh, UX and, uh, and just framework capabilities that we have now. Nice. So, yeah, there you go. I, I'm. Uh, I love that piece of remix forms mutations. You, this is. You still have no use state. <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't had any client side state at all. I haven't had to manage any use effects. Shoot myself in the foot trying to get all of that to work. And I mean, the UI instantaneously updated, which is just incredible and super powerful. Yeah, I feel like yeah. it's pretty rad. So. Anyway, there you go. That's you can now make customers. Um, this we, is forms, yeah. Yeah, we right? could add I mean, like a delete or something if you wanted to, but like it's that's all that it is. You you have a form, you have an action that does stuff based on the form. Um, one thing that is kind of interesting that I'll show you um, is uh, if you look at the the create new customer and pull up the the network tab when you create a new customer, there's actually one other thing that's on the form that I want to talk about. Uh, that's on that form data. Network tab, and then we'll go create a new. 
do I clear this? Uh, there's the, um, it's not an X, but it's in the top left next to the red button, that uh, cross out thing. Ah, yeah, there, there we go. And so we'll create, that's fine. And then we'll just use Brittany plus Netlify. Okay, so if you click on new, that second request that happened there. And then on that payload, it has this intent create thing. So mm -hmm. uh, we only filled in two fields. So where did that intent create thing come from? That is still not a remix thing. This is still web platform stuff. This is just like the way the web platform works. If you go to the uh, code now and look at that form. Okay, this form here? Yep, and go down to the submit button. Excuse me. Bless you. Uh, so we have a name and a value on the submit button. Ah. People probably don't do this very much. Um, but uh, this is actually part of the web platform is the ability to put a name and a value on a button. And so you can have multiple submit buttons for a single form. And the um, whichever one is clicked is going to be added to the form data. Interesting. That's the way that the web works. Yeah. Uh, and Remix just simulates that. So you would get the same behavior if we turned off JavaScript or if we changed this to a regular form. Um, I really like the way that Remix is moving towards web standards. And some of the newer frameworks are trying to move there too. But I feel like we got away from web standards where not a lot of these APIs are known because they mm -hmm. weren't used by frameworks. They're just different. And mm -hmm. so I really like that it's getting back to that so we can have some standards. Yes, yes, it's good. We'll, we'll use those. And and a lot of the standards that we're leveraging like really heavily have been around forever, um, like for decades. So yeah, pretty, pretty cool. Um, and so, yeah, you could have multiple submit buttons. So this would be useful for like an edit or, or maybe uh, update or delete. So you, you come to a, a customer edit page, you can change their name or whatever, hit update, or you can just hit delete. And so then um, that way you can key off of the intent uh, and you could call that whatever you want. You could call it um, action if you wanted to. That To me, that's confusing. So I, I use intent, but, um, or like sub action or, or whatever people call it, whatever they want. Um, but I always call it intent for all of the buttons. And then whichever one the user clicked on is the one that I'll, um, the action that I, I take in my action function. So that is, that is what is passing to this form data here is this name of the button intent. Yep. And then the value is create. Yep. Perfect. So yeah, it's, that's pretty rad. The other thing that people don't typically do, um, but uh, they used to do a lot, and they still do in the PHP world and stuff, is hidden inputs. Um, so uh, in my to-do MVC implementation, you have a check, bot or a check mark next to the item to do whatever. I'm just clicking the submit button. That checkbox uh, is a submit button. And um, for the back end to know which one I'm trying to toggle, uh, it needs to know the ID of the uh, the one that I checked mm -hmm. on. And so I have a, a hidden input inside of that form that has the you know to do ID. And so the back end can know, oh, okay, so the intent based on what they clicked on, I set the intent to toggle to do or something, or uh, I can't remember what I uh, what I call it, but and then the uh, the input um, ha the hidden input has the which one should be toggled. Yeah, I, I think we might get into a little bit more of that. Um, we're actually building out the form that we're going to use in a future stream. We have Prince Wilson and Nick Taylor coming on to talk about using the Netlify form with Remix. And so mm. we have a hidden input also that we use and Netlify uses that. So we might get into that in the next stream. Nice, With nice, a little cool. sneak peek coming up. That's going to be September 1st. Okay, yeah. cool. So this form is like all set and ready to go. Can we like yeah. push to get and... Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Let's deploy this okay. sucker. <laughs> <laughs> Get commit. Uh, if I could type message, we added customers routes and form it push. And that will automatically set off my deploy over here. It's already starting up. We can Sweet. watch that go so fast. Yes. So fast. It's like instantaneous. Do you have the app up uh, already as well? The live app? Yeah. Um, I don't know if I do, but I can open link a new tab. We can continue watching that. And why don't you so, log in while we're waiting for that to go? Because you will need to be logged in. 
Okay, so this is login from the notes app. So mm -hmm. you want me to log in? Oh, it'll to... be the same. Yeah, it's it's all the same user and everything. Uh, so yeah, stay logged in and then go to the customers uh, route, and we can wait for that uh, deploy now. Once it deploys, okay. we'll refresh and it it should still be logged in. Is that using the exact same auth system since they had created the Superbase, but it's using the same user? Um, I'm, I, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty confident that I'll be the same. Yep. Uh, oh, no, that has Rachel. Oh, maybe me. not. Oh. There it is. It's under profile. So oh, I don't okay. know if that's going to be, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, a different table. Different then. Yeah, it looks like you uh, have a user table. So yeah, you'll want to oh, log man. in. Oh, there's the error again. So how would I log in for the remix stuff? We didn't do like a login. Yeah, yeah, I didn't for... realize that they were uh, they were separate. <laughs> Two separate, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, huh, how did it work locally then? <laughs> I think I think you actually I don't might think... be okay. Um, you may be okay uh, as is. So um, and, and actually, clearly you are because you'd get redirected to the login if you if you didn't. So oh, okay. Yeah, so I think we're good. Um, yeah, because the site is live. Yeah, deployed. So, pretty dang fast, I might add. That was yes. Um, so yeah, let's try and create a new customer. Okay. So I'm going to create one for you now. Yeah. So Kent Remix. I just keep using coding cat dev. I don't know why. I, I just was wondering if you're inviting me to be a, like a co-host or something. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Anytime you can come back on code with coding cat. Uh, so there we go. It works. Totally works. Um, it works. Everything is functioning. Everything looks good except the occasional like Prisma errors we're getting, which I <laughs> that's really strange. Just a refresh like fixes that, but yeah. Yeah, that is kind of odd. And it is a very weird setup that I have going on because they had Superbase used for the user route that we just saw. And then I used Prisma with the same SQL-like queries we had before hmm. going to Superbase. So I don't know if there's yeah, just some there's disconnect some there that's happening. There. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, but like this is dang fast. Um, yeah. And it's all we, working. We actually have um, Prefetch implemented on these links. And so as you hover over those different customers and stuff. It actually prefetches the data for those customers so that um, uh, so as, as soon as you as click you on it, it's instant. Yeah, so you should see that in the network request, right? Yeah, yep. Yep, so we so, see each one just loading starts pretty coming in. Yeah, yep. and, that's, and, and like we showed earlier, those are all in the functions. Just make this functions. And now we should have some real time stuff here. Yeah. And what's cool too is um, we didn't talk about it, but the second argument to JSON is the um, the response config. And so you can add headers there. You could uh, set a cache header of like, hey, uh, if the client has this for 10 seconds, then like let's just let them keep the thing that they have because it's probably not different. Um, yeah. And so stuff like that. Uh, and you could put a CDN like Netlify. Uh, you already have a CDN in front of it. And so you can use S max age headers, maybe not for something like this because it's going to vary based on the, the user potentially. But um, but still like for static stuff, um, you could like if you had a CMS in addition to all of this, you could have uh, uh, just say, hey, S max age this thing. Uh, so I don't even have to touch the server for that static stuff. Um, and yeah, pretty so, pretty cool stuff. It's it's amazing what happens when you just use the platform. <laughs> use the platform, yeah. So you use those native cache headers, and you get like some of the benefits of that static site generation. That Remix doesn't provide static site generation, but you can use the platform to get it. Yeah, something. precisely. Yeah, awesome. That is yeah. so great. And um, so we have Jamstack com Conf coming up in November, and I don't know if I'm allowed to release like what Chance is going to be there for, but your colleague Chance the Dev on Twitter mm -hmm. is going to be at Jamstack Conf. Mm -hmm. I won't say for what yet, but going to be talking about Remix. So make sure that you go out and sign up for Jamstack Conf. I'll get the link. That is the speaker's link. That is not the one I want. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Jam now we're all comp. speakers. <laughs> yeah, come out and see us. We're going to be there. Chance is going to be there. Are you going to be there? 
Uh, I don't think that I, I don't know. Uh, is it in chance person? It's coming. It is in person. Yeah, it's going to be in San Francisco and it's oh, November that's right. 7th and 8th. Yes, uh, I am unavailable at that time, <laughs> but uh, I will be there in spirit. I'll, I'll send yes. chance for me. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That is great. And thank you so much for coming on and helping us set this up. Like I said, this is kind of a precursor to another stream that we're going to do where we convert this into a Netlify form, which is going to be really cool. I'm excited to see how all of that works and how it still kind of maybe uses the platform. Because hmm. I I love that form aspect of just being able to change it to a regular lowercase form and having it still work, which is Yeah, cool. yeah. Well, and if you, like, basically, you um, with Netlify forms, you're not going to be implementing an action um, in your route. Uh, you'll just have an action prop on the form and you point to the URL for your Netlify form. Yep. And Remix should still revalidate all the data on the client for you automatically and everything. So uh, whatever that that form ends up doing, as long as it sends back a successful response, then Remix we'll still like, get oh. all those benefits of like injecting right into the UI and getting those instantaneous updates. Yeah, yeah, it should. Um, I, I haven't tried it, but yeah. Uh, Fingers as, crossed, another as, live as coding long as, the, as long as the response from the form is a success, um, then Remix will be like, oh, you just submitted a form. All the data on the page is um, uh, all bets are off on that data. So let's go revalidate that stuff. So uh, yeah, looking forward to that. Yeah, fantastic. Awesome. And thank you again for joining us. This was so great. And thank you everyone for sticking around. And I guess we will see you next time. Bye. Bye.